Good morning and welcome to Nature Live Online. I'm Alison, I'm your host for today. Now, if you are new to Nature Live, these events are a chance for you to meet some of the scientific staff that work behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum in London. While we can't physically be at the museum, what we can do is bring our science and our scientists direct to you at home, which we are doing every week. Now, this weekend marks the anniversary um, of the birth of a pioneering scientist, Dorothea Bates. She was born on the 8th of November in 1878, and she is linked to the museum in a very, very important way. So we're, we're going to be finding out all about her fantastic life and work for today's Nature Live event. And I'm really pleased to be guided along the way by one of our paleontologists, Ruler Papa. Now, as with all of our Nature Live events, I'll have lots of questions for Ruler, but we would also really love to hear from you, our viewers as well. So please, please don't be shy. If you have any questions at all during our talk, pop them in the chat. We'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as we can in the time that we have. But let's meet our scientist for today. Rula, are you there? Hi, Alison. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you, Rula. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, now, before we dive into the life of Dorothea, tell us what you do at the museum. Oh, yes, I am uh, one of the fossil mammal curators um, and I really love my job. It's very fascinating and one of the key parts of my role is to look after fossil mammals. Um, and we have amazing and really, really scientifically and historically important collections. And I uh, have to document all these specimens that we have uh, or bring in more specimens from field work. I have to um, also liaise with uh, researchers internally and externally, answer variety and wide range of questions um, related to our collections. And I also uh, love participating on, um, on events that I am able to share my knowledge, uh, like today. But also uh, in the past, I have done some outreach events, um, like um, the fossil festivals that they're in Lyme Regis, in Scarborough, and also uh, Science Uncovered, um, organized by the museum. And um, I love also doing and involve our collections to new uh, projects like um, CT scan and 3D scan um, uh, projects where we can actually scan our specimens and have uh, virtual and 3D um, images of those available to the public. It's a brilliant way to, to give people access to our collections, isn't it? Um, and now in your job, you also get to find out about some of the amazing people that, that contributed to our collections that made it what it is today. And one of those is, of course, Dorothea Bate. But for people who maybe aren't quite so familiar with her, tell us, who, who is Dorothea? That's absolutely true. I mean, uh, collections is not about the collections themselves. It's also about the people that they've collected, the people that they work, they study the collections that we store in our museum. So to me, Dorothea Bate was an extraordinary explorer, uh, a passionate woman and a brilliant paleontologist and archaeologist with a really wide range uh, of interests in birds, mammals of Mediterranean, North Africa and Near East. So in a really really outstanding uh, personality and when did you you first encounter Dorothea when did you first find out about her so I um, work permanently on the museum since 2015 but in 2011 I had the opportunity to work for a year on a very specific project where I've curated the uh, amazing um, fossil mammal collection that we have from Tabun, which is a really key archaeological site from uh, in southwestern uh, Asia. So Dorothea was a key per person to basically went um, on, on the cave and excavate uh, with other uh, people and other women, uh, believe it or not, at that time, 
And mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to look through their, her diaries, her maps. Uh, so we can see here some of the incredible drawings that she did um, and, and her notes. And also go and, and buy, because I was studying her and her collections, uh, the amazing uh, biography uh, written by Caroline Schindler. Um, discovering Dorothea. So I, I really wanted to learn more about her and um, and that's what I really started learning in 2011 about her. What an amazing project to, to be able to work on and, and to introduce you to, to such a character. Why is she so inspiring to you? So um, I was uh, started, as I said, learning about her during the, the project, uh, the Taboon, uh, co collecting uh, from the Taboon Cave and uh, realizing how amazing she was uh, approaching the curation of the um, collection, but also the study of the material. And I also uh, knew that she was uh, the first woman who worked on Greek paleontological material and published scientific papers back in 1905 and describing new species in, uh, you know, I, for example, the Elephas crit um, criticus in 2000, in, sorry, in 1907. Did I, did I say 2005? I mean, I meant to... <laughs> 1905 i'm sorry <laughs> uh, and um and you know thinking about um at the beginning of uh, 19 uh, uh, uh an extraordinary woman going and collecting all of this i have this connection with the greek aspect uh, but also uh when uh, when i was looking around me i could see everywhere more or less her i was sharing also the office at the first contract with dr victoria harris and she was also studying the material that the fate collected from the mediterranean area and there was also a similarity of how we first began working in the museum absolutely you, you and she um you came to work at the nhm in, in quite a similar way tell us about that H how did you and she get your first jobs so I said about uh, Dorothea, she, uh, she seemed very, very uh, determined to work in the museum, as I, I should say. So Dorothea in 1898, at an age of 19, made a really historical visit to the museum. And in a way, uh, if I may say, she demanded a job uh, and, and her love for natural world made her actually to get at one. Uh, she made, uh, she, she, her first contract, uh, contact was Richard Sharp, a uh, curator of birds at the time. And um, although at the beginning she, he told her to go away, um, at the end he offered her an amazing contract working with a um, uh, bird collection. So my story, um, the beginning of um, uh, working at the museum was back in 2010 when I um, I really wanted to go and visit the place, but also wanted to work at the place. So I made a small search and I knew that um, uh, Ed, Professor Adrian Lister was working on uh, fossil mammals and uh, Mr. Andy Carrand was uh, the curator of fossil mammals. So I went um, uh, on the information desk, uh, the exhibition road, and I asked for uh, either Andy or, or Adrian. They were both at that time involved on um, a conference that was organized um, by Professor Adrian Lister, where all the quaternary um, experts working on mammals were there. And I couldn't, they couldn't find them on their offices. Uh, or I didn't have also an appointment. So it seemed that I would not be able to meet them at the time. Uh, but I was very lucky. And when I was about to leave, Professor Adrian Lister was waiting for, for one of the participants and I saw him and I just went there uh, and he was very surprised uh, and I said, I've introduced basically myself, uh, said, about, said a little bit about myself and he very kindly um, asked me to join the meeting. So I had the opportunity to meet other people. After a few weeks, I was volunteering for fossil mammals. And after a few months, I had this first contract with the museum. That's fantastic. So yeah, you both just knew what you wanted, turned up, the mu up at the museum and ended up with a job. I think that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> 
Now, Dorothea herself, she started out working on, on birds, didn't she? So how did she then come to work on fossil mammals? So yes, that, that's true. Um, her first contract was with um, a project on birds, uh, but she was, um, as I said, very young and the museum for her became her university. Um, she was very skilled um, and uh, she uh, had her first um, her first time when she had to study material from the caves of the cliffs above the river uh, Y. She found 15 species of mammals and birds uh, dating back uh, to Pleistocene and with uh, the um, really big support of Henry Woodward, uh, the keeper um, of uh, geology uh, at NHM um, from 18 to 80s to 1901. In 1901, she published her first paper on that material and she was just only 22 years old. It's, it was amazing. It's incredible what she achieved. Uh, and when we say, uh, just before we, we move on, when, when we say the Pleistocene, she worked on Pleistocene mammals, what, what, what do we mean by that time period? Because we tend to associate it with the Ice Age, is that right? That's absolutely correct, Alison. Yeah, Pleistocene known uh, also as Ice Age. And the Pleistocene mammals seems to captivate Dorothea's imagination because they, um, they give you a really good chance to study why animals became extinct and how, how others survived and evolved uh, into creatures that we have today. So there, it works like a breed linking the past with the present and the future. So I say it's for most geologists, it refers to the last glaciation. So we're talking about 100,000 years to 12,000 years ago. But the ice age sometimes refers to the whole period of the last 2.5 million years when the Earth's climate has been relatively cool uh, with dozens of glacial periods within it. Right. Uh, now we're, we're going to uh, find out a bit more about uh, some of her amazing uh, Pleistocene finds. But just a reminder to viewers, uh, if you've got any questions for, for Rula, post them in the comments and, and we will uh, get to your questions as well. Um, but Rula, her digging uh, at Y, that was just uh, one, the first of what would turn out to be a whole number of pioneering expeditions. So, so where did she, she go next? Where did she end up doing fieldwork? So, so Dorothea, as myself, she had a very good support um, group of people. There were many people that they've supported in the museum, although it worked uh, at the time that no many women were around the museum. Uh, Henry um, supported Dorothea to go abroad and, and start a field work on the Mediterranean islands. So between 1901 and 1911, she explored the Mediterranean islands of Cyprus, of Crete, uh, Balarix, discovering numerous of fossil remains of extinct species. Uh, many of them were new to science, very new. So over here we can see a map from uh, Cyprus and, um, and she, she was always very well prepared before going to uh, any field work. Um, if you are able to see, there are some uh, lines in black marked, and you can see basically with these marked lines, the paths that she covered. She walked a lot. She covered miles and miles discovering and trying to find out, um, you know, fossil mammals uh, from cave sites. I, I love that this is her original map and you can see the little lines that she, she drew on. She she covered so much ground and bearing in mind this was on foot and on, on, on the back of, of a donkey. How did she know where to begin? So, yeah, uh, that's a very good point. Um, so in 1901, she went to Cyprus um, and she was invited. She was uh, very lucky to have um, a family there that they were very close to her family the Woodhouse family, and they invited her to Cyprus. So after uh, being really known and published a paper on, um, um, on the Y um, collection, uh, she got permission and support to go and excavate there. And one of, um, of her colleagues uh, from the geology department, Charles uh, Forsyth uh, Mayer, told her that actually she has a big chance to find really unknown fossil species from Cyprus and Crete, as we will see later. 
she had excavated um, on um, different areas uh, in Cyprus and under really difficult conditions and really dangerous, I, I could say. Um, she even contracting uh, malaria while in, uh, in Cyprus and excavating, really dangerous, but she survived and she also worked very hard. And she made some incredible discoveries, didn't she? Tell, tell us, uh, uh, let's take a look at, at some of the, the things that she, she found, uh, first of all, in Cyprus. We've got this amazing animal here. W what are we looking at? So today we are really uh, lucky because with this show, we don't have the opportunity to see real specimens uh, that we store back in our uh, collections. And we have um, thousands and hundreds of uh, specimens that she collected from, uh, from these islands. In uh, this slide, you can see um, a hippo skeleton, but it's not the usual hippo that, uh, that we know and lives today in Africa. It's a dwarf hippo. So we are talking about a hippo, which was tall to not more than one meter to his shoulder. And, um, and in a way, it's really tiny. Um, so if you want to, to really get that in more perspective of scale, we can see the next slide, which has a, a comparison between how an adult of a nowadays hippo looks like and above you can see the the, the task the canine of a dwarf hippo it's really really amazing um and and these creatures really inspire and captivate the uh, dorothea's imagination it's incredible the, the size difference there teeny tiny hippo but it wasn't just hippos was it there, there were elephants as well Exactly. So uh, she discovered, so you can see here how amazing she was on your left hand side. You can see um, drawings that she did, actually. It's it's really uh, amazing uh, what, what she has uh, done. Um, so here you can see a mandible, a lower part of the jaw with uh, one uh, tooth uh, attached. And this is from a species uh, known as a straight tusk elephant, which um, was the ancestor of um, African elephants. And, uh, and the size is really tiny. You can hold this specimen on your palm of your uh, hand. And just to give you again an idea of the size, um, an elephant, that this elephant would have been a meter tall as an adult the same size as a newborn African elephant. Uh, their main, mm. uh, mainland ancestors, as I said, the stray tusk elephants, however, they were larger as adults um, than the African elephants today. So uh, th this, this uh, image here shows the difference in size and we can see also comparison between an adult um, uh, L tooth from an adult stray tusk elephant um, from the mainland and an adult from the island so it's it's amazing uh, the difference between the two yeah yeah that is an incredible size difference do we know why do we know why some animals sort of shrunk down when they they uh, came to live on islands yes um it, there, there has been a lot of research around the dwarf species uh, professor edwin lister victoria dr victoria um uh, Harriet, uh uh, Leila, uh, the Suzanne, they have done research, thorough research on dwarf elephants, um, hippos, and deers. Um, and we know that large uh, animals, when they get isolated, they adapt in this new environment uh, really, really fast. Um, and, and their uh, island environment will limit food. And they, in that environment, we have lack of predators. So usually one an animal is getting big when it's um, a herbivore animal uh, to protect itself from predators. When on an island with less, even no um, predators, uh, they don't need to be very big. And they need also to adapt uh, to the new resources of food. So they're getting smaller. And dwarf species are uh, extinct nowadays, but between 8,000 years and 3,000 years ago, they thrived in islands. And we know that the uh, climatic fluctuation between that period was rapid, and they were rapidly changed and adapted on this new uh, environment. 
It's absolutely incredible. And this, this, um, this, these questions about how animals evolve on islands, these prompted Dorothea to her, her next expedition to the, the island of Cree. What did she find there? She found something quite special, didn't she? Uh, not that slide. Um, I think we've got the, the slide that we had before um, with the with a little yes, tiny we, um, yeah. elephant skeleton. Yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, the one. That's yeah. The <laughs> Uh, so yes, uh, yeah, she she went uh, after uh, Cyprus in um, in two, in uh, 1904. She went for a field work in Crete, and Crete is really really a completely different geological speaking um, island. And she found she thought that she found the same species uh, as she found in um, um, in Cyprus, but um, and she. She named this uh, species as um, a new species, Elephas um, uh, criticus. But apparently, we've discovered that um, uh, through, uh, through PhD that Dr. Victoria did, um, that her, this species is actually a mammoth. And you can see on the top uh, photograph, uh, next to this green uh, small dot, you can see these rings. They're very distinctively mammoth-like characters. Uh, so she found, she discovered a new species while she was actually tried to, to cover and explore Crete, uh, the, this mountainous island. Um, for four and a half months, she was there and she discovered really amazing specimens. It's fantastic, and we, we yeah we we tend to think of mammoths as as being in cold places, but not necessarily. And and this idea of them shrinking down as well, it's 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 absolutely fantastic. Exactly, amazing exactly. discovery. And how are Dorothy's specimens? Are they still being used research today? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, we um, we have every year uh, questions around the world, and uh, we have also internal researchers, but we have also external requests. They are coming to uh, to compare with um, their material, with um, to, to discover more. There are new uh, also studies on paleo diet, on paleo ecology, and paleo environment, and there are also new techniques. There are upcoming uh, new research using and uh, employing um, new techniques uh, such as a uh, CT scanning and uh, 3D laser. So we uh, we have I am lucky uh, to have a collection that is really used from um, from new uh, from for answering new research questions. Absolutely, we, we find all new ways to, to study old specimens, so it's it, it's fantastic. Um, and there, there's one particular um, specimen that Dorothea found in, in in the caves of Majorca and Menorca that is still being debated today, isn't it? Tell us about this strange animal. That's really true. Um, she went um, in uh, 1909. She was 30 years old on this um, remote cave of this island. And uh, and she came across um, to this really uh, narrow, uh, small miniature goat-like antelope, uh, and she she was really fascinating uh, because you know there are some features on on the skull uh, that when uh, when you know how goats look like today, you can definitely say that there is something weird happening here. It has an enormous, um, uh, there, there are enormous large um, front teeth uh, on this species, while on the goats today we have six so relatively small uh, front teeth. And, and she, she thought that this looks like a, a mouse. So she named this, uh, this goat um, uh, Myotragus. My Tragus uh, Bellaricus. So it is also even com is it is also known and referred to as a rat-like goat, cave goat, antelope gazella, or or you know simply um, Myotragus, which is translated literally from Greek as mouse goat. It's an extraordinary specimen. Again, a dwarf um, uh, species. It's amazing. I think we've got a, a, a we had a, a slide with a reconstruction of, of Myotragus. It's a yeah, very yes, bizarre looking animal. 
yeah and yeah. you can really see those those bottom those two crazy teeth at the bottom yeah they're really uh, brilliant the brown, they're they're really like a rotten uh, like mm. teeth because they have they're growing from open roots and they're you know constantly growing uh, and you can see also the reconstruction of, uh, of this animal it is still uh, something that uh, we know it lived um, mainly there only on uh, mallorca and um, uh, um island and uh it's very interesting species. absolutely <laughs> so through through her field work and also through her, her studies and, and working at the museum Dor dorothy kind of developed this incredible knowledge of all kinds of fossil animals and, and an international reputation as well but she also she forged links between archaeology and paleontology didn't she so tell us about that uh, that's that's true. Yes. Uh, so so I was um, telling you that I've I've explored um, her first in 2011 through the Tagun collection and mm -hmm. and her work um, in East basically. And here we can see uh, her in um, in Palestine excavating, and you can see next to um, this helper's hand a, a tooth from an elephant. Um, she did. Uh, she had the chance to collaborate with really uh, important figures of archaeology, including um, uh, Dorothy Garrett. So she excavated with her between the 1929 and 1934. Uh, they published together one really unique um, volume of all the. Um, all the fossil mammals, fauna remains from mountain Carmel, and here we see uh, the Dorothy uh, Garrett uh, portrait. And um, this was published. The Stone Age of Mount uh, Mount Carmel was published in 1937. Uh, they not only described new species um, from various sites, but she also addressed these paleo environmental questions. So she's really she's really uh, looking to to answer and address important questions so one example was that she looked for example from in uh, uh, collection she looked dama and gazella species from different layers and she was trying to address um these questions where where actually the climate was moist and where it was drier uh, so very intelligent and very um, interesting questions by uh, through through different sort of um, uh, researches yeah absolutely and, and and so relevant as well to understand the the environments that that you know our, our human ancestors were liver, living in uh, so it's absolutely uh, crucial I, I, that's that's really true because um thank you for saying that Alison um, Fossil mammals are also important because we can address the paleo environment that uh, our ancestors lived. So mm -hmm. um, we can answer also indirect questions related to our species. So that's a very good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a question come in from one of our um, viewers, Trevor, on uh, Facebook, and he has been reading Carolyn's fantastic book, Discovering Dorothea, which we can't recommend enough. There it is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. And Trevor says that he was struck by the quality of Dorothea's illustrations of her finds. And we saw an example in an earlier slide. Is there anything known about where and how she studied and, and gained such drawing skills? I uh, I don't know specifically if she took any, you know, um, course in details. But I know that uh, from, from my also personal experience that the more you practice, the more um, you learn and the more skills you develop. So I think um, Dorothea Bate was a very uh, skillful person. Uh, she self-taught herself a lot of things, anatomy. So I wouldn't be surprised that she self-taught herself drawing things. Um, and, uh, you know, the best place to 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 self-taught yourself is uh, basically the museum and over there she had some she was surrounded from some really incredible people so she might have some key uh, also inspiring per personas um when it comes to drawing but i don't know specifically if there was one 
or two people that uh, inspired her on that field. Uh, I, I imagine she yeah, I imagine she taught herself <laughs> from what I know of Dorothea she is yeah she, she sounds like such an amazing person and she did have that amazing collection and all those those fantastic people at her disposal so um, yeah I wouldn't be surprised if she taught herself <laughs> now Dorothea Absolutely. she went from yeah she went from enthusiastic amateur to literally world-renowned expert in in her field what do you think is, are some of her biggest influences on paleontology or, or archaeology today what what is her biggest legacy do you think well i think um something that uh, is really really uh, incredible is that well, we, we did dance a little bit and we did say a few things, uh, but uh, in general, I think her legacy is that she was an amazing, amazing fossil mammal curator. Because when even when she stopped working on, on um, excavation, she was not just staying at the museum and doing, if, uh, you know, uh, only a few tasks, but she uh, basically had so many different links around the world that many people were sending her um, dwarf uh, species or even other animals from Ice Age period to identify. So I know that there are many, many publications that she's not the first author, author but she is acknowledged a lot. So many people are helped, she helped many people, but she also addressed uh, some really key uh, archaeological uh, questions, as uh, one that we already mentioned was between uh, Dama and Gazella from the Taboon collection. Uh, she discovered from uh, Bethlehem uh, some species uh, of ancient elephants, uh, turtles, and early horses that the, the remains of these and the discoveries are are still, you know, update to the present because there is a, a slightly complicated situation in Bethlehem region. So there, there are no new excavations taking place there. So that's, I think, quite important. Um, and and the fact that she she was able to discover new species is a big deal nowadays. No many people have, you know, uh, the chance to go and do new field work and discover uh, new species. Absolutely, and we've got a, a question that came in from YouTube that's, that's uh, linked to that a little bit, um, saying, uh, were the animals Dorothea found in Palestine different from the ones on islands like Crete and Majorca? That's a very good question. Uh, so uh, Palestine is in mainland and, and all the other um, examples that we mainly present today are from islands, so we have an isolation, um, and uh, as we were explaining, those uh, ice age animals that they lived in mainland, they they developed different body size. They were different in uh, when compared with uh, the island forms, and and, uh, and there were also many small mammals. So in different sites in within mainland, we have also different um, uh, fauna remains, different variety of species. She has uh, such an incredible influence on, on uh, paleontology today and on the museum as well. Um, Rula, as a paleontologist working today, how have um, practices changed since Dorothea's day? Have they changed very much? Um, they, I think they, there are changes. There are definitely uh, changes. I think um, the opportunities uh, for for the past paleontologists to go uh, and start a new excavations they were uh, more. Uh, but um, but I was also lucky um, to be able to participate in, in new excavations. So in in Greece and and in Europe, I I had the chance to go and hear. To go on excavations. So um, I think now because of all the new technology, you know, we have uh, things are much easier uh, in some in to some extent uh, because we have the machines, because we have the technology, and and also uh, we 
we are not digging in dresses in Victorian dresses. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's, that's really true. really uh, important. Uh, so, I but I I believe when you have excavating uh, is is difficult, but it can be really really fun if you have the right bunch of colleagues, the right people to just support um, uh, and work and collaborate with you. Uh, it's also uh, different in in the sense that um, things are now uh, more standardized and there are protocols that we can uh, follow um, and we can follow and we can have a consistency um, on, on things. Uh, and I think practice uh, was was different at that stage. So Dorothea started from, from scratch, if you like, while mm -hmm. we have something to start and we have uh, different protocols. Um, the, the paperwork is more or less the same, maybe, uh, I think. <laughs> but yeah, some practically, there are some practicalities that they do yeah. the same, definitely. Absolutely, some, some digging practices I was reading, they, they raised my eyebrows a little bit. Use of dynamite back then. We're not, oh, we're not allowed to use that anymore, are we? <laughs> No, no, no. That's that's absolutely right. Yeah, she she did this uh, this sort of jobs. She was really amazing. But absolutely. yeah, we we are not using anymore. No, definitely not. <laughs> and the the the, the loan working because she she initially when she was uh, out collecting, particularly in Y and and earlier projects, she was sort of off on her own, and wasn't she? She was just getting out there and and doing it herself. Yes, she uh, she very rarely had um, she she was starting alone. Uh, she had in some expeditions um, her uh, brother uh, close to her and some uh, helpers, some local uh, guide people. Like we have this uh, slide uh, where she worked with someone from the local community. Uh, to support her, but mainly she was um, she was alone, and uh, and that's why I think it's incredible thinking of her um, working under difficult conditions, uh, both in Palestine and also in Cyprus when she got ill, and in Crete, which is a very difficult um, geological speaking mountain. Uh, she had also to you know uh, moving from work field work in Cyprus to field work in Crete she had to change um shoes and outfit in a way because you know in order to approach these dangerous mountains you need to be dressed a little bit different you can't go unprepared so absolutely I think, yeah it, she it, yeah she achieved so much absolutely incredible really determined really uh, tenacious woman and, and what what a, a fantastic Kind of uh yeah what an inspiration to have uh, and and we're so lucky that she she worked at the museum and for a long time didn't she her entire career at the museum yeah yeah um, many years uh it, was it 50 years 40 years mm -hmm. uh, or 50 years so um she was much more than a fossil hunter Dorothea. she became uh, you know, the go-to person for any quiet re related to fossil mammals. Mm -hmm. She was really um, incredible. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And in terms of your work today, Rulo, are you, do you still get to work with um, with with Dorothea's specimens? What, what what projects are you working on? Yeah, um, I as I said, I look after a big uh, collection of uh, quaternary mammals, and I am also responsible for. Uh, a lot of specimens that Dorothea uh, collected from the Mediterranean islands, for example. And um, um, I have different curatorial projects that I am um, supervising. But I oh, I have also, I'm always keen to share my knowledge and, and, and provide uh, any sort of training that I can provide to uh, volunteers or new uh, members of staff. But one of them, um, uh, my research focus is uh, Pleistocene uh, mammals, and specifically, uh, I did my PhD on bears. And um, I, I am also one of the two experts in in the UK on dental microwear technique, which is a method uh, where we look very fine features, details on uh, the surface of teeth species. 
of different uh, mammal species and we are trying to extract information about the diet of these species so with this technique you are able to see um, uh, the details the marks that the last food of, of the two last week of an animal's diet left as a mark on on the surface so i um i have studied these features and it's um uh, really a privilege to share wherever whenever i can um my knowledge also around my research uh questions yeah that's incredible research and i'm, I'm sure dorothea would have been fascinated by that particular project <laughs> she would have loved it <laughs> <laughs> We just have a, a just a very a few, few minutes left. So, so before we we wrap up, um, Rula, why is it so important to celebrate fig figures like Dorothea? I think nowadays, as a, as always, we really need to have people that will inspire us and will give us the, this sort of motivation to do more and more. Um, and and this is uh, where I believe um, Dorothea. Uh, whoever uh, will come across with her, or I really strongly recommend read the book that um, about her uh, biography, because it's really a true uh, person that will inspire you. Um, so discovering Dorothea for me motivated more and more to do more. She didn't know uh, the word, word no, and she was really, really capable, and she was really hard worker. She worked very hard, and I think we really need such examples in our life. Definitely, and if, if you haven't um, read that book, I would highly recommend it. Uh, I, I read it myself recently, and I just, yeah, I found her her passion and her thirst for knowledge is, was was very, very contagious. And it, it's an absolutely fantastic book by Carol Chinder, Discovering Dorothea, so, so do read it if you haven't. Uh, but Rula, it's been fascinating. It's been fantastic uh, chatting to you today. Thank you so much for, for telling Thank us you. all about Dorothea and, and about your work as well, which sounds fantastic. Um, I hope that you'll come back and talk to us again at some point. But um, but for now, thank you very much. We'll, we'll say goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. And thank you to you, our viewers as well, for your for your questions uh, and for, for staying with us for this, this fantastic talk. If you enjoyed it, do join us again. We do Nature Live every week on Tuesdays at 12 and on Fridays at 10.30. So you can meet more of our scientists, find out more of our, uh, about our collections and about our research as well. So tune in. You can also uh, watch our shows after the event on YouTube as well. Uh, so take a look at our website keep an eye on our social media feeds as well to, to find out about what's coming up next but for now we will say goodbye to you that was nature live online i'm alison sheen and we'll see you again soon <laughs>